Hey, we are one week into 21 days of prayer and fasting. How many of you joining us in 21 days of prayer and fasting? Let me see you. Let me see you. All right. Hey, about this time, one week in, you should finally start feeling better. You know what I mean? It's like, it's the, the hard part is over, but uh, no matter where you're at beginning this, maybe you even, you know, cheated a little bit, fell off a little bit. Can I encourage you? Just pick it back up and start again. Okay, start again. This is a phenomenal um, opportunity, really, to go deeper in your relationship with God, to combine prayer and fasting, and we're excited to take this journey with you. We open up the church uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 every morning during 21 days of prayer, January 6th to the 26th, and if you're available to come to that, it's a great experience. We do worship. There's a devotion by a pastor, and then we just do individual prayer up until 7.30. It's kind of a come and go as you have the time. would love for you to take this opportunity, though, to go deeper this year, man. And if you'll let me, church, if you'll let me lead you, man, and use the Sunday experience as really the Sunday experience as a catalyst for you to go deeper in your relationship with God than it's ever been before. Come on, how many of you with me? You want to go deeper this year, amen? We're going to go deeper in 2019, and we're going to see a different result because of that. Uh, let me show you some key verses that are part of this series, you guys. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7 says, Let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. And that's what we're talking about, uh, this idea of going deeper. It's in a relationship, deeper in a relationship with God. Because honestly, what, what good is it if, if we have a successful career or more money or even better relationships and stuff, if in all of that, our faith isn't, Paul, the apostle says it this way, what good is it if I gain the whole world and I forfeit my soul? Like it, it, our faith, the only way our faith can be strong at, after 21 days or at the end of even 2019 is if we get rooted in Christ, if we go deeper in our relationship with Christ. We're using the parable of the soil in this series. And if you missed last week, we kind of introduced this concept of the soils and, and what the key was and uh, if you haven't read the parable of the soils in the Gospels, Jesus tells this parable of scattering seed along different soils. And every soil represents a different type of heart. And we're going to study the different type of heart conditions. But at the end, we started with the end in Luke chapter 8 here. Jesus tells the meaning of the parable. He says, here then is the deeper meaning of this parable that I just told you. The word of God is the seed that is sown into hearts. The seed that fell into good, fertile soil represents those lovers of truth who hear it deep within their hearts. That, that is where the seed of God's word was always intended to go. It was intended to fall on a fertile soil. Seed was, seed was always meant for fertile soil. It was always meant to be planted in soil. So let me say it this way. This idea of deeper, deeper was always God's design. I mean, that, that is what a relationship with God was always meant to be. It was, always, it was always meant to go deep into your heart. So this deeper is just not a season of stretching. Oh, I'm going to go deeper. I'm going to go stretch. We're going to stretch. And I'm glad. Let's stretch. Let's do it. But I want you to kind of see this today, that that, that seed was always meant to go deep. That's what, that's what it means to follow Jesus. It, it was meant to be something deeply rooted in our hearts that would bear fruit in our lives. It says they respond to that by clinging to the word, keeping it dear as they endure all things in faith. This is the seed that will bear much fruit. The seed of God's word was always meant to go deeper, okay? I was talking to um, an Indian missionary not too long ago, and um, he was all dressed in Indian garb and everything, but he wasn't, you know, going to India to be a missionary, he was actually from India coming to America to be a missionary. Do you guys know that people all over the world are coming to America to win America for Jesus? And this intrigued me, and I, I asked him about his call. Talk to me about the call of God. That, 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 what did you hear from God to really leave there and come here to America to win America? Talk to me about that. And and he said, I am here. God has called me to America to save Christians from Christianity. He said, here in, in, in Christ, Christians here think that they can be a Christian. They can serve God in the abstract. And God cannot, you cannot have a relationship with God in the abstract and in the distance. God was always meant to be central. 
He was, we were, he was meant to be a part of everything. And then he said, he said, you American Christians cannot expect God to show up in your life and in your government and in, and in your land. If God is not central, then he is not God. And I thought, wow, that's deep. That, that was always meant, it was always meant, your relationship with God was always meant to go, to go deeper. And the reason why all of our, maybe we're, we don't have that relationship with God, and there's all the different types of soils have a different reason. But the one I want to look at today, one of the reasons why we don't have a deep, intimate relationship with God is because some of us keep God at a distance. We distance ourselves from God. Let's look at the first soil condition backing up now in Luke chapter 8 verse 12 where Jesus is talking about this farmer scattering seed and he says the the seed the seed along the path are the ones who hear they hear the word they even show up maybe maybe they show up 75% of the time on Sunday. So they're hearing it but it's just not it's not producing something in their life. And, I mean, it's not, they, they walk out of here and it's like, man, it's like they didn't hear it. It's like it, it didn't change their thoughts and their attitudes and their behaviors and their lives. It's just, so so they're, they're hearing it, but the devil comes and he takes away that seed, that word, from their hearts so that it may not, they may not believe and be saved. So this, this seed that fell along the path, the path represents distance from God. It didn't fall where it should have fell on fertile soil, but it fell along the path. But I want you to see, not only does it represent a distance that we keep from God, but it also represents a hardness of heart. That, that the path has been trampled on. It's, 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 it's a hard surface, and the seed of God's word can't penetrate there. It can't, it can't take root to anything. It's not only distant, but it's... It's a hard heart. That, that in the distance, it actually got harder. And the further the distance, the harder the soil, the harder the heart. So last week, if you missed it, go online, check it out. You guys um, watch that online. We gave you the first principle in this, in this uh, idea of this year being like the uh, deeper. Let's go deeper. We said, hey, the first thing is the order is important. The order is important. Whatever you put first goes deepest into your life. You take root. It takes root into your life. You give power to whatever's first in your life, and you establish roots to it. So whatever is first goes deepest. The order is important. That was the first principle I gave you in order to go deeper this year. This second principle, are you ready for it? Is worship. If you want to go deep, if you want to go deeper, you, you, you have to embrace worship. And worship, this is what worship does, not in your notes, but up here. Worship softens the soil of our hearts, and it brings us closer to God. That's what, that's what worship does, you guys. Worship is not a service. You know that? It's not a service. Worship is, is, and we all worship something, every one of us. Worship is expressing affection to the things we value most in life. That's what worship is. And we all, we all have values. We all value things. There are important things. Last week we talked about the things that are important to us. And sometimes we don't live in the right order, the things that we say and know are important and that we value. Worship, though, is expressing affection and devotion to the things that we value the most. So you're, you're worshiping something. You value something. It's taking up time and place in your life. You're expressing affection and devotion to something in our lives. We all worship something. We all, we all worship something. And worship, though, is the, it softens the soil of our heart. And I want to today, before we kind of get into what worship is, and I'm going to explain that to you in a moment, but let me, let me kind of get into why, why the distance. Why is there distance between us and God? Why can't we worship God like we want to worship God, some of us, or like we should worship God and have that kind of relationship, that deep and intimate relationship with God like we want to? What is the divide? Why the gap? Why the distance? Write some notes with me. There are what I've found like three major reasons why, and just in my ministry experience, why there is a distance between us and God. Here's the first reason. And this one is huge, you guys. This thing called shame. Shame that, that some of us, we were ashamed of our past mistakes still. Some of us are, are, are ashamed of our shortcomings, the things, the, the things that just we find that, are, that shouldn't be there still. And we're ashamed of those 
things. Now, this is this is how, look, this is how the enemy steals the word. He steals the seed from, from the soil so that it won't bear fruit. The enemy will take something that you did and convince you that that is who you are. That's what, that's what shame is. There's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I did something. Yeah, I did something. I messed up. Shame is when you believe that that something is who you are. That's what shame is. And I used to think that the, the enemy's main tool was temptation, in which he is. He's a tempter. He's a good tempter. He's good at tempting you to do things that you, that you know are wrong or that are wrong. But I found out that he's not just good at temptation. He's actually even better at accusation. He's the accuser of the brethren. He will, he will not, a, not only tempt you to, and, and use temptation to make you do something wrong, but he'll use accusation to make you believe that you're something that you're not. He'll want you to believe. And, and, and any time anytime that, that your heart is full of shame, listen, you hide from God. Shame will cause you to hide from people. It just it causes you to close your door, not answer your phone, put distance. But any time that you have shame in your heart, you will hide yourself. You'll create distance between you and God's presence and God's words. So, so it doesn't bear fruit in your life. And that's the enemy's, the enemy's plan. It happened at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. We see it happen with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they, they sin against God and they partake of this fruit. And then their hearts are full of shame. And God, God goes looking and calling, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3. He's, he's calling for Adam in the, in the garden, which is so cool. It's, I love that God goes searching because no matter how far you are, Okay, no matter what you've done or what sins you think you're committed or what you think is still in your past and holding you back, God will always chase you down with his love. He'll always come looking for you. And he comes, and look, he doesn't, he doesn't expose our, our sin to shame us. God exposes our sin to change us. You see, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's not, he doesn't want to shame you. He wants to change you. So he's coming and searching for some of you because you think you are what you did and you are still your past and your, your mistakes and your, your sin. And God is searching for you, not to, not to shame you, not to shed light on that, but to change you. And he's looking for Adam and Eve. And, and he, Adam answered, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. I hid from your, your presence. And all of, all, listen, all of us make mistakes. All of us have legitimate reasons we feel guilt. Because we're guilty. But God, but God doesn't want us to live that way, full of shame of like, oh, I, sh I should be different and I should be better. Listen, that's why Jesus went to the cross. Jesus paid for your and my condemnation so that we don't have to pay for it anymore. Not only the things in our past, but everything in the future is paid for. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, that's not who you are. You are not your past, you're not your mistakes, you're not your sins. That is a tactic and a scheme of the enemy to rob the seed of God's word from your heart. It is a tactic to put distance between you and God so that you would develop a hard heart and hide from his word and hide from his presence. Are you guys seeing this? Are you feeling this today? Come on, are you with me? Okay, so that's, that's, that's one of the, the primary reasons I see that people distance themselves from God is they still think they are there yesterday. And they don't know who they are in Christ, man. Shame will distance, you'll, you'll hide from God. Here's the second, the second reason we keep a distance from God, and that's pride. Now, I know none of you here deal with pride. None of you do. No one here deals with pride, right? Right? It's so hard to see pride in our own life. I mean, it's just, it, it's because we're prideful. We don't think that that exists, but pride is this me-oriented, selfish spirit, right? It makes people arrogant and hard to get along with. It, 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 uh, this one's scary. It honestly is. Pride is a scary thing because whereas shame will cause you to hide from God, pride will cause God to hide from you. Man, amen. Ooh, you, is that out or amen? Because that was, was preaching right there. Because God, the Bible says that God opposes the proud. He's in opposition to, he's an opposite to, he rejects it, but he gives grace to the what? To the humble. To the humble, he gives grace. So when you're when you when you have this, when your heart is full of pride, God says, You can't even find me with that. I'll oppose that. I reject that. There's distance. And because of that, look at this. I love what Proverbs chapter 21 says. It says, haughty eyes and a proud heart. Look at the word it uses, the unplowed field of the wicked. 
I mean, that distance that I created because of my pride, because of my arrogance, because of the posture of my heart towards God or towards people, I act, that distanced me from God. And because of that distance, it, 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 it not only made my heart hard, and, but it produced sin in my life. You see, you're not the problem. Your habits aren't even the problem. The problem's the distance. Your pro, here, proximity is your problem. You're not in proximity for, of God. And because of that, our heart has become hard and produce. That's pretty, the distance is actually the problem, you guys. Proximity. Now, because we, uh, it's hard to ascribe to the label of pride for very many people. It's like, it's hard for us to just say, I'm, I'm prideful. Very, so let me kind of, I found something online I want to share with you guys. I want to share with you the fruit because it produces, it produces something in our life. So maybe, maybe you can't, uh, you know, ascribe to the label of pride, but maybe you can see some of the fruit of it in your life. So let me, let me, pride versus humility. Let me show you this. Pride focuses on others' failures. Humility realizes how far they fall short and have an overwhelming sense of their need to grow. Pride is self-righteous, overly critical, and fault-finding. Humility is compassionate and forgiving. Pride looks at their life through a telescope, but others with a microscope. Humility looks for the best in others. Pride looks down on those who aren't as spiritual or as committed as they are. Humility seeks to win people, not arguments, and realizes only God knows a person's true motives. Pride thinks they, are, or thinks they know who is truly proud and truly, uh, truly humble. Humility leaves the judgment of the heart in God's hands. Pride thinks everyone is privileged to have them involved on their team or in their life. But humility thinks they don't deserve the opportunities that God gives them. So maybe, we, maybe the, the label of pride is, is hard, but maybe, but maybe you focus on others' failures a bit much. And maybe you're a little overly critical. You, you fault find a lot in other people's lives. It's under a microscope, but maybe not... Maybe not your life. And, and so, maybe, it, listen, if these things, if this fruit is in your life, then, then the Bible says God distance himself from you. He, 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 will, he will pull out the rug. He will, he's in, and it's not a good place to be in opposition from God, the God of the universe. But this is, this is just one of the things that, that I see that causes distance between us and God, that we can't truly worship God the way we want to worship him and go deep in our relationship with him because we're still shamed. We're ashamed of our past and our mistakes or we're too pri- proud to admit them and go all in with God. Here's, here's the third reason. Here it is. Write it down. Number three is fear. We're afraid of what it looks like. We're afraid really what God's going to do if he gets a hold of everything. We're afraid that, that man, if I, if I truly went all in and went deep and, and, and even worship, what will other people think? And we're full of this fear of people, fear. And I love what the, the wise prophet and Jedi master Yoda said. Star Wars, anyone? Star Wars fans? Okay. Fear is the path to the dark side, right? Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. I'm telling you, this is the second time I've, t- I've quoted Yoda in a couple months, man. You know I'm a Star Wars fan, okay? But it's true. This is true. Fear leads to distance. It leads to the darkness. It leads to a dark side. It, it, it will lead to anger and, and suffering. This is what the Bible says, First John chapter 4, verse 18. But there's no fear in love. There's no, there's, and love is the key. We talked about this last week. Love is the key to fertile soil. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with, oh no, what's going to happen? The one who fears has not been made perfect in God's love. Look, you're not alone if you're dealing with fear today. You're not. You're, you're actually in really good company because, because um, fear caused Abram to lie. Fear caused Moses to to question God's call. Fear caused Elijah to hide. Fear caused Peter to deny. Fear caused Thomas to doubt. But hear me today. Listen, everything that you want in life is on the other side of fear. Everything you want in life is on the other side of fear. And we need to get beyond our shame. We need to get beyond our our pride and beyond our fear if we want to have a deep and intimate personal relationship 
with Jesus Christ. And if we want the, if we want the seed of God's word to go deep enough in our hearts that it actually produces lasting change and fruit in our life, we need to go deeper. Let me say it this way. I don't know if this made it in your notes, but going deeper moves us from spectators to partakers. Going deeper moves us from the sidelines, watching on the sidelines, from spectating to participating. You know a spectators thing? Spectators believe that they're worshiping just because they showed up. I showed up to church. I mean, I'm watching. I'm watching, and I have to worship. That's the, you're welcome, God. I'm here. You're welcome. I showed up. I showed up to church. Okay, worship isn't a service. We call it worship service, but it's not a service. Worship is your expression. It's your response to what you value most. That's what worship is, all right? If, if, if I told Veronica, my wife, if I told my wife Veronica, honey, I love you. I want you to know that, but I'm not into the old hugs and kisses and touching and stuff like that. I'm just, I'm just not, it's not me. I'm not me. Just, I don't even like to say I love you, but know this one time. Know this one time. I love you in my heart, okay? I just love you. Don't expect to hear it again. How many of you know that's not going to fly with my wife? Because she, she wants to hear it. She wants to know it. She wants to, to see my heart and my affection and my love. She needs it. It's not this like, well, do you love me? You know I love you. No, nah, you know I do. No, she needs to hear that love. She needs me to express that love to him. And some of us, we go, well, God knows I love him. I don't love him like you love him, but God knows. No, God wants to hear it. God wants to know. He wants to see the expression of your heart, the affection of your heart, because you value him most. And this is the, the James chapter 4, he says it like this, because th this is the greatest invitation of all time. Come close to God, and God says, I'll come close to you. Come on. God says, look, if you, just, if you draw near, I'll draw near to you. Look it, check it out. Listen, some of you are waiting on God. And you need to know God's waiting on you. God has already made his move. He showed up and, and, and expressed his love in a way that we will never express our love to him. He allowed his son to die so that he could be close to you. Now it's your move. So what do we do? C come on. Let's, let's make our move. Let's make our move. Let's draw close. Let's come close. And God says, I will come close to you. I'll close the gap. I'll close that distance that's creating a hard heart that's putting between us. If you just draw near, I made my move. All you got to do is take a step, and I'll take a step towards you. So let me ask you this. Would your, would your 2019 be better if God came close to you? Come on, let's make our move then, church. Let's draw near to God. And some of you, maybe that looks like taking a 21-day prayer journey. Because maybe you don't have this consistent prayer life in your, maybe in 21 days, that's what it takes to develop a habit. And for some of you, maybe that's the step. Maybe that's the deeper step for you is to take 21 days and begin a devotion life. Maybe it's reading your Bible for 21 days and starting a devotion life there. For some of you, it's just this little, it's clapping. That's what, some of you, that's all you need to do. Come on, serve 11 a.m. service, just give God a little something, Okay. That's it. It don't even have to be on beat, all right? Or even the toe tapping. Just go there. I don't care. Again, not even on beat. Just don't even worry about the rest of your body yet. If you just start here, it'll travel its way eventually up your body. But express some worship and affection to God. He wants to hear it. He loves it when we express our worship to him. God loves that. He loves it when we, when we do that. So what does God really want then? What, is, what does God want? Does God want, you know, our, our clapping? Does God want our, our dancing? Does God want, you know, our, us to be on the dream team, us to go to a small group, us to go to unity? What, is, what does God really want? What is worship? You see, all those other things, all those things are just byproducts. But worship is actually just so much deeper. It's so much deeper than those other things that, that we focus on. Those are just the byproduct of something deeper that happened in your heart. Okay, let me, I want to explain to you very simply what God really wants and what true worship is, what deep and intimate worship is to God, what he wants. Okay, I'm going to explain it to you out of a psalm, Psalm chapter 50. Psalm chapter 50 is a prophetic psalm, meaning David wrote it, but he didn't really write it. It was God moved and inspired David and actually spoke to his people in first person on behalf of himself prophetically. It's a prophetic psalm 
chapter 50. Let me show it to you. Psalm chapter 50 up here. God's God speaking prophetically through David. I have, God says, no complaint about your sacrifices or the burnt offerings you constantly offer. Well, that's good, God, because you told us to do it. Right? Okay? So I, I, and you guys need to understand this. Like, in this time, God instituted a worship system, a sacrificial worship system that they would come and make sacrifices and burnt offerings to God. Like, that's what he instituted. And God goes, I have no complaint about that. Well, good, because you told us to, God. What, what's going on here? God says, I don't need bulls from your barns or the goats from your pens. Like, I didn't need that stuff. You're giving me something. Like, thank you. I appreciate it. I told you to do it, so I appreciate it. But I didn't need it. I didn't need that stuff for all the animals of the forest they're already mine. Like before you killed it and you offered it and you did what you did with it, it was, I already owned it. It was, you're giving me something that was already, it was already mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. It's, it's all mine. He continues, I know every bird in the mountains and all the animals of the field. They're mine. In fact, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you because the entire world and everything in it is mine. When you bring your tithe, I mean, thank you. I mean, I told you to do it and stuff, but I wasn't broke. I didn't need it. You're giving me something that I actually already had because I own it all. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need that stuff. Do I eat the meat of bulls? Do I drink the blood of goats? So he's setting it up. God is setting up, like, like what is it then, God, that you don't have? I mean, you, 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 all this stuff that we've been giving you and offering you, you already have and you don't even need, then what is it, God, that you don't have? Let me say it this way. Worship is giving God something that he doesn't have. Okay? I want you to let that soak in for a moment. Worship is giving God something that he does not have. All right? Some of you think, well, that's not theologically correct. God owns everything. No, no, he doesn't. He actually gave something away. He could have. He's God. He could take whatever he wants and have whatever he wants, but he gave something away. You know what it is? You. Your heart your free will, and that which was given away and surrendered by God that he gave now becomes worship as we freely offer it. Come on, are you seeing this, church, you guys? That, that is, that is worship when we offer ourselves to God. Now, what is it then? He goes on. What is it? Wouldn't you like to know what God doesn't have? He, he explains now. He goes on. He says, make thankfulness and this is what I don't have. This is what I would love. Thank you for all that stuff. But make thankfulness your sacrifice to God. Just, just, just gratitude is what I would, I would like to see. And, and keep the vows you've made. I'd like to take our relationship to a whole other level. Like keep the vows you made. Then call on me when you're in trouble. You call on a lot of people. You got a lot of people you go to. But I'd like to be your, your go-to. I'd like to be your your first call, not your last resort. That's what I'd like. I'd like you. I'd like to have that place. And then when you do that, then I'll show up in your life. I will rescue you, and you will give me glory. Then when you do that, you are giving me worship. See, all that other stuff, God says, I don't, I don't need it. I have it all. I, got it. I, don't need, I don't need all the lights in a bigger room and all the sound and all the dancing, and it's great stuff. Don't get me wrong, it's, it, but it's just a byproduct. God is like, I'm sure, God's like, I made the lights. I'm the father of lights. Man, you ought to see the lights, the star show that I can put on, man. You, God, right now, the angels never stop declaring God in angelic glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty dancing and giving God praise. So what does God really want? You to shout holy some more, dance or clap some more. Listen, it's great. He wants to hear it. But those are byproducts of something so much deeper that is true worship. Are you hearing me, church? Come on. You want to go deeper in your relationship with God, then you need to understand what worship is. Because worship softens the soil of your heart and it closes the distance between you and God. So what does that look like? Let me, let me give you these last three things that God says, I don't have. All the other stuff, all the stuff you do and you give, and I, say, I got it all. I already had it all. Thank you. Thank you for it. But I already have it. You're giving me something I don't have. What does God not have then? Let's, let's write it down this way. Here's number one, just two words for each one of these. Thank him. That's it. Just 
thank him. Isn't that simple? Here's the key, though, with sincere affection. See, I, I, if worship is giving my heart and my affection to something, what does God really want? Does God just want me to show up 75% of the Sundays? Does God want me to, now he wants me to serve and give and, and, and go to unity in a group and all those stuff. No, 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 you're missing it. It's some, those are just byproducts. It's something so much deeper. He would like it if you would just thank him with sincere. He would like it if a, a sunrise one of these days, you look at it and you go, wow. God, that, that's awesome. Thank you for that, God. He would like that. He would like it if you express sincere affection to him. As a dad, I, I do this all the time, man. I do things for my kids all the time just so I can get that. Just so I can get the, wow, daddy, thank you so much. How many parents know what I'm talking about? That feels so good. And I'm not like a, <clears throat> I don't need affirmation. That's not my love language. I don't, I, don't, I don't need that in my life for me to keep going. I have other things that kind of get me going. But, but on our five-year anniversary, we just celebrated in September our five-year anniversary at church. And it was really, we always in our anniversary tell, tell a lot of testimonies and stories and all these life change things that happen. It just inspires more people to tell stories. And it was just so cool. People, I heard so much about what God has done and changed so many people's lives. And it was really cool. It's why we do what we do. And I love it. I really do. But what, what I loved more than that, honestly, is after one of the services, when I walked down off the stage and my oldest daughter was here, in the front row, she usually does. She worships one service. She'll serve in another service. And as I got down from the stage, and I, she was just standing there looking at me. Her face was glowing. And she was just in a, like an amazement face. She said, wow, Dad, that was amazing. You, you, and she said like this. She says, you the man. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Can I tell you something? That melted. She didn't give me anything. She didn't give me anything. In fact, I probably took her out to eat special because of that, because I just wanted to love on her. I'm still paying the bills and stuff. She didn't do nothing for me. She just, listen, she looked at me with this honor and this respect, and she expressed some affection to me. I mean, can you imagine now, that's all God wants, and that is worship. When you just, when you just, Look at that sunrise, and you go, wow, God, you the man. <laughs> when you, the next time you take a breath, you go, thank you, God, you gave me that breath. You just, when you just thank him, when you honor him and thank him with sincere affection, that is worship. That's what worship is at the, at the deepest, at the heart of it. Because here's what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 69. God right now. The Bible says he's looking. His eyes are ranging, looking around, not for people who showed up to church, not for people who are, you know, serving or giving or all those things. No, 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 those are byproducts. He's looking for fertile hearts. Hey, where's the soil? Where's the, whose heart? He's looking for a heart that's totally committed and ready for the seed of what he wants to do in your life. Come on, somebody. That's what we're, that's worship. It is thanking him with sincere affection. You got to figure out a way to express it to him, church. Here's number two. He, he says, then fulfill vows. What are vows? Vows are when you take the relationship to a new level. So what do we do? Here's worship, you guys. Here's it. Here's worship. Two words. Offer him. Offer him what? You. Offer him you. Like offer him all of you. For some of you in this room, you need to take your relationship with God to, you know, to move it from this casual Sunday thing, this like, I'm into it, I'm into it, you know, I'm into it, I like discovery, I'm into it, you know, I'm a believer, you know, I'm a believer, I love God, I love God, you know, okay, love God, I, I hear come, that's my church, okay, from, from that whole, like, but I love God, but don't ask me to do this seven days a week kind of, kind of thing, okay, so listen, at some point, God wants you to stop dating him, at some point, God expects you to walk down an aisle, to put on a ring, and to make a vow of commitment and say, till death do us part, God, I give myself to you. That is worship. That's worship. When you offer him the control of everything. I'll show you the scripture, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. 
Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God, how he treated us. He didn't treat us like we deserved. Didn't give us what we deserve. He gave us grace. He gave us mercy. He gave us love. We deserve punishment, but he gave us mercy. So because of that, let's offer yourself. <laughs> offer your bodies. Offer who you are. Offer everything as a living sacrifice, holy. And that's what's pleasing to God. And this is worship. That's what worship is. Worship is not the, not the byproduct that you think it is. It's not the clapping and the dancing and don't get me wrong, that's affection that he wants, but it's deeper than that. Worship is when you walk down the aisle and you offer him everything. When you surrender the control of your entire life to God, that is worship. When you say, God, I give you, I give it to you. I, I, give, you my, I give you my emails. God, I give you my social media. God, I give you my relationships. God, I give you my career. God, I give you my, I give you everything, God. It's all, it's all yours. I give you my, my breath. I give you my school. I give you my time. I give you, I give you 10%, God, but that's not all. I, I give you it all. It's all yours, God. Help me to use it as you want. All of it, God, it's all yours. I'm yours. That is worship, okay? You want to go deeper? You want to go deeper in your, and, and not allow the seed of God's word to continue to be plucked up by the enemy because the distance, we maybe because of shame or pride or fear or so, some other reasons why our heart becomes hardened. If you want to go deeper, then you need to, you need to close the gap and worship God. Worship God. And the way, the way we worship God, what is true worship, is when you thank him with sincere affection. you got to figure out a way to let him know to express it. He wants to, he wants to hear it. It's when you actually offer yourself, not your things, your heart, yourself, your body, your everything. I am yours, God. But then the last thing, the last thing that God says, I don't have, and I would love, it's worship when you do it for me. The last thing he said is when you're in trouble, call me. I mean, I'd like for you to call me. I'd like to be your first response, not your last resort. Write it down this way. Number three, include him. Include him like in your everyday life. So the next, include him in that next party that you're planning. Include him in your game. Include him in your job. Include him in your marriage. Include him in your driving, in your meals. Just include him in your everyday life. You see, when we, what we effectively do when, we, when he's not our first call, what we're effectively doing is substituting the real God for lesser gods. Because the order is important, right? It's, it's when, we're, when we're, we're substituting the place of God for other things that are not even God's. Here's what Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 14, 15 says. Do, don't follow the other. Those, don't, don't put those things in that place. Don't follow those gods, the gods of the people around you. And so what are the gods of the culture around us? What are the things that people are giving affection to, that are, they're expressing affection to, that they value the most, that they're devoted to, those things that are not gods? He says, don't do that. For the Lord your God who's among you is a jealous God. And he's not like a jealous girlfriend or a jealous boyfriend. He's a jealous father. He's going, man, I wish you would, you know, clap and yell for me like you do that football game. Come on, Eagles, playoffs, baby, playoffs, baby. But he looks on. He's jealous. He's going, man, I wish, I, wish, I, I wish you expressed your affection and devotion to me because you value me just as much as you value that game. Man, I, man, I wish you'd show up on time for me like you show up on time for that movie. Because <laughs> not only do you show up on time for that movie, you show up early because you need your popcorn, you need your soda. You need to see the previews because you want to see that new movie preview that's coming out. And God's like, man, I wish you'd... Sh Ouch, amen, something, yeah, okay. So, so God is like, I, man, I wish, I wish I'd be the one you'd call. I wish when you were in trouble, you'd, you'd, you'd call me. You wouldn't keep calling them or turning to that and, and, and valuing that. I wish, I wish you'd just call me because I'd rescue you. I'd close the gap. If you just drew near, near to me, I would draw near to you if you just included me in your everyday life. So what does God really want? You know what? God just wants us to express our affection and thankfulness to him. That's what God wants. God wants us to thank him with sincere affection. That's what he doesn't have that. He doesn't. What does God really want? God wants us to actually offer him everything in our life. He doesn't just want a day in our life or part of our life. And he doesn't want your stuff. He doesn't want your acts of service. Those are just byproducts. What he wants is you. That's what worship is. 
That's what he doesn't have. When I offer him me, God, I'm, I'm yours. I totally surrender. What does God want? He wants us to include him everywhere, in every part, to be God of everything in our life. What does God really want? Let me just boil it down to this. God just wants to be close to you, church. God just, God just wants a relationship with you. He wants to, God just wants to close the gap. And the beautiful thing about this is this is the only, this is the only way that the soil of your heart can get ready for the word, can get ready for transformation. The only way is through closing the gap. The only way is through closing the distance. That's what softens the soil. It's when we worship God with sincere Effect. Look what the, pro, the prophet prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 36. He says, I will, give you, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And look at this. I will remove from you your heart of stone. Man, when you draw near to me, look all, all it is. It's, see, it's a distance problem. It's a proximity problem. The reason why your heart is hard, the reason why the seed is falling on the path is because you're not close. If you just come near to me, I'll come near to you, and I'll give you a new spirit. I'll give you a new heart. I will remove that heart. I'll remove the hardness of your heart and give you a heart of flesh. I'll till the soil of that thing. If you just came close, there's no other way that this seed can go deep. There's no other way unless you close this distance and draw near, and I will put my spirit in you and check this out. He says, and I will move you to follow my decrees. God says, look, it's, see, the problem isn't your habits. You focus on your habits every year and your resolutions, the problems, the distance. If you just close the gap, I'll put a new spirit, a new heart in you, and guess what? I will actually move you from the inside out to produce a different fruit and a different result in your life. Come on, somebody say amen and give God some praise today. God just wants to be close, church. Come on, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. God, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy constantly pursues us in spite of our mistakes, God. You love us. You love us. In spite of our shame and our pride and our fear and all the things we allow, we allow to distance us from you, God, close the gap today. Maybe you're here today with every head bowed and eye closed, and you feel like God is like far away from you. You feel distance from God, like a gap between you and him. And maybe, you, maybe you've been close to God before, but, but you just feel so distant from him today. Today I want to help you. I want to pray a prayer over your life and with you and for you to do that, that second thing where we offer God everything like you. That's what he doesn't have. He doesn't have you. And you can only give it away. And today if you, what that is, honestly, that's what salvation is. It's surrendering your life to him. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, he says, you'll be saved. I'll close the distance. That distance you feel, it doesn't need to be there. God says, you close, just draw near to me and I'll come near to you today. I'll give you a new heart, new spirit, and then I'll change you from the inside out. Some of you are here today because you need that. You need to close the gap. The distance is the problem. You're not the problem. It's the distance. And today you can draw near to God. And he'll draw near to you with every head bowed and eye closed. If that's you and you're ready to surrender the control of your life to Jesus and get a fresh start, a new heart and a new spirit, a new life, whether you've done it before but you need to close the gap again or maybe for the very first time to surrender the control of your life. With every head bowed and eye closed, I'm not going to have you come to the front, but do me a favor and be brave and lift up your hand right now. Come on, lift it up and say, I'm closing the gap today. Yes, 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 yes. Come on, yeah, 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 yeah. Praise God. Here, 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 here. Leave it up. I want to see. Come on. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yep. There. Praise God. All over this place. All back here too, over there. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you, God. Go ahead and put them down and pray this prayer. If I miss you, just pray something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come on, tell them. I'm tired of living distant from you. Today, I'm closing the gap. And I'm, I'm making a move. I'm drawing near. God, I... I surrender the control of my life. Come live inside of me. Give me a new heart, new spirit. Change me from the inside out. I am yours, God. Thank you for saving me. God, I speak over every person right now 
that we are, we are not our yesterdays, we're not our sins, we're not our past mistakes, that shame will no longer, no longer cause us to hide from you anymore. We're not going to allow it. That's not who I am. I am who you say I am, God. We're not going to allow shame to have any room in our life anymore. Pride, God, I pray that you would break it right now in the name of Jesus. We need you and we are desperate for you, God. Close the gap inside of our life. Take over and have control. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today, church. Amen.